Well, now I know most of you have kind of heard the history of the trust before, so uh, I'll try to uh, not repeat too many of the same pieces, but I think part of my job is to explain the history of the trust, what our mission is, and how we relate to the commission, uh, and then what you can expect in working with us. So, to start in the beginning. In the beginning, uh, the territory of Alaska had what can only be described as a barbaric mental health system. In territorial days, it didn't matter if you had a developmental disability, a mental illness, if you were a chronic alcoholic, uh, if you were a senior with dementia or had a, uh, a closed head injury, if you had any serious mental disability and you came to the attention of the territorial officials because you couldn't take care of yourself with what existing services we had, which, as you will remember, weren't much. Maybe you had family in Alaska, but most people didn't. Uh, maybe there was a church or some other community organization that would offer some assistance, but it was pretty thin. So if you came to the attention of the federal officials because you couldn't take care of yourself, they actually tried and convicted you of a territorial crime called being an insane person at large. Now, you didn't have to have done anything wrong just have had a mental disability and not be able to take care of yourself, and a federal marshal would fly you to Morningside Hospital in Oregon where you would serve a life sentence and never return to the territory of Alaska. Now, as we approach statehood, this understandably was an issue for both Alaskans and the federal government. Under the territorial system, the federal government paid for Morningside. If we were going to become a state, we were going to have to, at a minimum, pay for the people that were at Morningside. But of course, we didn't want that system anyway. And so a debate ensued in Congress around statehood about how to deal with this mental health issue in Alaska. In fact, few people now remember that this actually held up statehood because they couldn't come up with a formula to address this issue. At one point, the Washington Post uh, ran a banner headline that said, Siberia, USA. And the tag to the article was that the uh, federal government was about to build a gulag. Now, remember, this is in the late 50s with the Red Scare and all of that. Uh, the federal government was about to build a gulag in Alaska where all the dissidents would be sent. Well, it wasn't a gulag in Alaska. It was Alaska asking to have its own programs for people who experienced mental disabilities. Eventually, Congress passed a three-pronged strategy to address this mental health issue. The first and the most straightforward was a capital grant uh, to the new state to build uh, the first wing of the Alaska Psychiatric Institute. Incidentally, they also bought a motel in Valdez that was the first Harborview Developmental Center for people with developmental disabilities. Well, of course, Alaska has a rich tradition of pork, and in fact, Harborview Developmental Center was one of our first pork barrel projects because Governor Egan was from Valdez, and so it was his idea to take some of this money uh, and use it to buy the motel in Valdez and create some local jobs. Incidentally, that was also the first step in starting to take what was a unified and integrated mental health system, meaning that all people with mental disabilities were treated together in the same system, and segregate out one population, in this case the developmentally disabled, uh, to be served in a different place, in a different location with different services. And we'll see how this plays out in the formation of the trust in a minute. So that was the first thing, capital money to build API and buy the motel in Valdez. Now, we didn't have any operating money, and so the federal government promised to provide some operating dollars to the state to operate these two facilities, and that would diminish every year over eight years to kind of wean us off of the federal dole. Now, at the time, Alaska did not have any real visible means of support as a would-be state. The federal government owned 98 percent of the territory of Alaska. And so the continued funding for this mental health program, even if we were able to develop it in Alaska, was certainly uh, open to question, if not doubt. 
And so they came up with the idea of taking a lesson from the school land trusts and university land trusts that were created in many states when they entered the Union. And of course, Alaska has both a university land trust and a school lands trust. And they decided to create the first, the only, and no doubt the last, mental health land trust. And so under the Enabling Act, the state of Alaska was entitled to select one million acres of land from the federal government to hold in trust, to generate income, to pay for the Alaska mental health program. Now, one thing that the new state did exceedingly well was to select the lands. In fact, the mental health trust went first. And so we selected some excellent lands. Uh, Homer Spit, Kenai River frontage, part of the Chugach uh, Mountains behind Anchorage, uh, the big trees in Haines, the Beluga coal fields. In southeast Alaska, the mental health trust lands looked like donuts around every community. And the theory was good. As Alaska grew, its population increased, the mental health needs of the state would increase, but these lands would become more valuable, they would generate more income, to pay for these services over time. Now, once we picked this million acres, the state then also got a 100 million acre entitlement from the federal government for general state purposes. And they proceeded to select that 100 million acres. Now, I will say when we selected our million, one thing we didn't know about was Prudhoe Bay. 100 acres or so in Prudhoe Bay, and we'd have one heck of a mental health program but we did get some very good lands. But when the state got their 100 million acres, they just rolled this million acres of mental health land into the big pool. And over the next 25 years, half of that original million acres ended up being taken out of the trust. Well, how did it get taken out? Well, the Chugach uh, area got taken for the Chugach State Park. Uh, if you go into Haines, we gave that to the bald eagles and created the Chilkat Bald Eagle Preserve out of mental health trust lands. We gave coal leases to Usabelli Mining and other coal companies at less than fair market value in order to stimulate economic development, but not generate appreciable income as required under the trust. Many of you probably remember uh, when we had a number of land uh, uh, giveaways or other sorts of ways of putting land into the hands of private Alaskans. We had homesteading. We had land lotteries. Uh, we had all kinds of ways of getting uh, land. Well, eventually, 5,000 individual Alaskans through those programs ended up with pieces of mental health trust land. We used to call them the moms and the pops. And they proceeded to build their houses, uh, farm their crops, raise their animals, uh, mine their gold uh, out of those mental health trust lands for which the state received no value. Now, this all started to come undone in the 70s because in the 70s, local governments like Anchorage, Fairbanks, Juno, others, gained the ability to start to select state lands for local uses in the same way the state had selected lands from the federal government. And when they started to select these lands, if you think about where the mental health lands are, it shouldn't be a surprise that even though our million acres was only 1% of the state's portfolio, it constituted over 20% of the lands selected by local governments under uh, the Selection Act uh, that they were operating under. Now, when their lawyers went down to the courthouse to record their record of title, what they found was that these lands were, in fact, mental health trust lands for which their clients, the local governments, were paying nothing. Well, that meant they were probably on notice that the state was breaching their trust responsibility by simply giving these lands away. And so they went to the legislature in 1979 and said, hey, we want to get clear title to these lands. Do something. Well, the legislature said, of course, that's what we're for. And they passed a law. And they said these million acres of trust lands are now general state lands. Well, now they had lawyers. 
And their lawyers told him, well, you can't just do that. You're trustees. You have to pay for this land. And the legislature said, no problem. And they opened a bank account called the Mental Health Trust Income Account. And they promised to put 1.5% of the income from all state lands into this account to pay for the lands and provide funding for mental health services. Well, the only problem was they forgot to make any deposits. Ever. Amazing. Just like you forget your mortgage payment every month. Well, it only took the mental health advocates three years to figure out there was something wrong with this. And so they went to Fairbanks and they found a lawyer wearing a cowboy hat and cowboy boots and he wanted to make a name for himself and Steve Cooper filed the original mental health lands trust suit. Now, Steve Cooper has absolutely the best history with the Mental Health Lands Trust of any individual Alaskan. In 1979, Steve Cooper was in the legislature and voted to steal the land. In 1982, he would file the lawsuit to try to get it back. And as governor, he would preside over two failed settlement attempts. It doesn't get any better than that. So that was filed in 1982. By 1985, we had reached the Alaska Supreme Court. Now, this is a pretty major case in Alaska jurisprudence. It took the Alaska Supreme Court three pages to rule on this case. I always tell people I remember two things from law school. One is recent widows always win. And the second is trust breachers burn in hell. And the Alaska Supreme Court said, look, this trust was set up by the federal government to benefit these people. You were given the land in trust. The legislature was designated as the trustee. You have given away half of this land for no value. You are in breach as a trustee and private trust principles apply. The remedy is give the land back. Oh, no. How are they going to give it back? Usabelli's mined it. 5,000 individual Alaskans have houses on it. The eagles have built their nests on it. There's no way to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, in the legal profession, we call this a lawyer's dream. Because we would spend more than the next decade trying to resolve this mental health trust problem. Now, I won't go into all the attempts to settle along the way. Uh, suffice it to say that the mental health trust still holds the record, believe it or not, for the most legislative special sessions on one topic in the history of the state. Now, eventually, we were able to fashion a settlement, and here's how it worked. First of all, we needed to get back to a million acres. People believe that having land in the long run is a very important component of the trust. So we gathered together a group of stakeholders, and it was an interesting group. It were the environmentalists, the coal miners, the developers, the local governments, uh, representatives of the park systems, you name it, we had them in the room. And what we did is we developed a list of replacement lands for the lands that were taken from the trust. So, for example, since we lost the trees in Haines, we wanted some timber that we could harvest. Well, the environmentalists didn't want us to have trees in pristine areas that they wanted to preserve as wilderness. So what we did is we looked for areas like Icy Cape, uh, Thorn Bay, where logging was already happening and we identified timber in that area that could be put back into the trust. Well, actually, this served our purposes as well, because in those areas, log transfer facilities, roads, and other infrastructure was already in place, which, of course, reduced our cost of developing and harvesting that timber. So we got back to a million acres. But now, remember, we had some of the most valuable land in the state. And what we were getting back was certainly not worth what we had given up. So there needed to be a cash component to the settlement. 
Now, I thought that when you settled a case as big as this, and you were going to be talking about millions and millions of dollars, we would have a very scientific approach to figuring out what exactly the right amount of money would be. No. We said $500 million. The state said $75 million. We said $400 million. They said not a penny more than $125 million. We said $300 million. Everybody got mad and went away. In a week, we got back together, and I don't even remember who it was, but someone said $200 million. And the other side said, okay. So we had a $200 million cash endowment. Now, the most critical thing here was, who was our trustee? If you think back, the trustee designated by Congress was the legislature. Well, the legislature hadn't proven itself to be a particularly helpful trustee. And there's a, a common sense reason for this. Legislators have a broader public trust responsibility to every Alaskan. It's very difficult, even with the best possible legislators, to get them focused on a subset of lands and cash that apply only to a subset of Alaskans. Frankly, it's a flawed concept to think the legislature can act in that kind of a trustee role. And so one of the things that we negotiated for in the settlement was the creation of an independent board of trustees that could oversee the management of the assets, the land and the cash, and most importantly, be able to spend the proceeds without a legislative appropriation. Now that was, in fact, harder to get than the land and the cash. Because why do legislators go to Juno to spend the money? But they didn't have a lot of other good options in front of them, and we were able to conclude the settlement. Now there's a couple other things I want to briefly touch on that are part of the trust settlement framework. One is, if you remember, uh, we had started, even at statehood, taking some of these populations and moving them out of uh, the common unified mental health program, if you could call it that, at Morningside. Well, we continued that pattern in practice as Alaska grew. So although the court had said that the beneficiaries included all those that went to Morningside, in our state service system, we had divided these populations up. Not only had we taken the developmentally disabled and moved them into a different service system, uh, the chronic alcoholics, for example, alcohol, got its own division. We took senior services, including those for people with dementia, and we put them in a different department. And there was actually a phase of the litigation where the representatives of these different beneficiary groups argued with each other over who was in and who was out. It's what I call circling the wagons and shooting inward. Uh, and we actually had to go back to the court to get this settled. And that's where the court said, no, this trust was created for all the people that went to Morningside. And at a minimum, that includes people with mental illness, people with developmental disabilities, people who are seniors with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, and then uh, people uh, with chronic alcohol problems. That at a minimum, those are the four beneficiary groups. Now, the state is empowered to add beneficiaries to the trust, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the first step was to how to unify these services again, because what we realized is in creating these silos, we also created a non-integrated system of care that often worked at cross purposes, uh, didn't treat people equally, and often didn't meet their needs. So one of the parts of the settlement is the creation of a comprehensive and integrated mental health program plan for the state of Alaska. Now, the primary responsibility for developing that plan lies with health and social services. Now, they must work in conjunction with the mental health trust. Now, why would we use a word like conjunction? 
Does anyone really know what working in conjunction with someone means? No. And that's why we use the word. <laughs> we knew that there had to be a working together, but we didn't know exactly what that might look like. And so we tried to find a word that wasn't so clear that people would know right away what it meant but had enough wiggle room in it that as we worked together over time, we'd be able to figure out how this would work in practice. Now, when the trust got established, the other thing that we looked at is if we're gonna integrate all the services into at least a plan, if not a single service system, well, what about the budget? I mean, let's face it, the money is where the rubber meets the road. And in the past, when we had all gone separately down to the legislature to advocate for our programs, what we ran into is, well, is it one of the big three? Is it education, public safety, or transportation? Historically, those have been the big budget items uh, that tend to get the focus of the legislature. And so one of the things we negotiated for was that the state would pass the budget for this comprehensive integrated mental health program in a single separate appropriation bill. Now what we hoped is that this would elevate mental health more into that category of education, public safety, transportation, and mental health. And that's why when you get down to the legislature and people talk about the mental health bill, that's what they're talking about this separate appropriation for mental health, which incidentally is the only appropriation bill that combines both capital and operating into a single appropriation measure. Now we have a seven member board of trustees and as most of you know, they are appointed by the governor, they are confirmed by the legislature, uh, they serve five year terms, they can serve two full terms and they can only be removed for cause. So the new governor, or any new governor, uh, or any governor even during their term cannot just remove the Mental Health Trust Authority trustees and appoint new ones. They have to either wait for terms to expire or they have to have good cause and of course that's pretty serious. That's something like missing meetings or otherwise acting uh, inconsistent with their trustee responsibility. But now you have seven trustees and an earnest staff, but how could we cover all of the needs of all of these disparate beneficiaries? If you look at the budget for the mental health program of the state, it's about $135 million a year in general funds. If you add Medicaid, it's well over $200 million. That's a lot of needs, a lot of service delivery issues across a very large span of influence. Well, the only way we could see that the trust authority could function is to rely upon those planning and advocacy boards that are closer to the issues than the trustees and the trust staff. And as you all know, there are four of those. The Commission on Aging is one, the Governor's Council on Disabilities and Special Education, the Alaska Mental Health Board, and the Advisory Board on Alcohol and Drug Abuse. Statutorily, one of your responsibilities is to bring to the trustees your recommendations as to how uh, we should both use trust income to fund mental health services and what we should ask the state to fund in the separate appropriation bill for mental health services. Without our partners, the trust cannot function. There is no way that we could really put together the kind of people that are in this room and in the other rooms of the planning boards, people that understand what families face, what providers face, what we need to do to provide adequate services to our beneficiaries. So we rely very heavily on the boards to participate uh, in this process. Now let me back up very briefly and talk just a little bit about how the trust is organized in terms of spending the money. Now remember we have this million acres of land and 200, originally $200 million. Now the trustees recognized right away that if all we did was spend 
the income from any given year in that year, this would not be a very sensible system. Because some years, the permanent fund would do very well, and you would have a lot of money to spend. And other years, they would not do very well, and in fact, some years, they might even lose money. Well, that doesn't really lend itself to any kind of sensible long-term funding stream. So at the very beginning, the trustees decided to follow what's known as a foundation model, meaning that they would take the income from the land, that seemed okay, but for the cash endowment, they would take a payout based on a percentage of that fund every year. They would add it to the land income, and that is what they would have available to spend in the following fiscal year. Now, they started out at 3%. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have heard the Permanent Fund Corporation, which manages our cash as part of their fund, would also like to go to a percentage of market value payout. One of the issues is what is a sustainable payout level? Now, the level being discussed for the Permanent Fund is 5%. There's generally accepted financial expertise that holds 5% to be probably at the high end, if not a little above, what is sustainable over time, if you intend to also inflation-proof your fund. So the trustees decided to take this payout. Well, now we had another problem, though, is that's okay if you take that 5%, but remember, we are a perpetual trust. So unlike a private foundation, we cannot invade the principal. We can only spend income. Now, if you're the Rasmussen Foundation, you not only have to make that 5% payout, if you have to go into your principal because your investments didn't make any money that year, that's fine. You can make that 5% payout out of your principal. We couldn't do that. So the trustees set up an income reserve so that we could build up a reserve for those years where we didn't generate enough income from our investments at the permanent fund to make the payout. Well, how big of a reserve should we have? Well, we contracted with Callan and Associates, the financial advisors for the permanent fund. They looked at our fund and decided, recommended to us, that four times our payout would be an appropriate level for a reserve. Now, we were very fortunate. The years that we set up the trust were very good years for the permanent fund. And we were able to put away that reserve within the first three and a half years. So our payout went then from 3% to three and a quarter, to three and a half, to three and three quarters. And two years ago, the trustees raised it to 4%. Every time you raise the payout, you also raise the amount of money that needs to be in the reserve to cover it. Now, does this system work? Some of you will remember a few years ago, the stock market had a pretty serious correction. And in fact, the permanent fund lost millions and millions of dollars over several years. The trust never missed a payout. The reserve at one point was down to 145% instead of 400%. But it worked. We were able to continue to make the payout and continue to support the services that we were funding even during that time. Well, now how does the trust spend this money? Well, let's go back and take one of the very first examples and then I'll talk about where we've evolved from here. But I think this first example is pretty representative of the thinking that the trustees have used in spending this money. We talked about Harborview and Valdez. For years before the trust, the Governor's Council on Disabilities and Special Ed realized that we didn't need to institutionalize people with developmental disabilities. Even those with the most severe disabilities could be well served in small, home-like, community-based alternatives. And in fact, we had a moratorium on admissions to Harborview for several years while we started to develop these community-based alternatives. We had whittled down the population at Harborview, which at one time was over 200, down to 80. Unfortunately, when you have an institution like that running with a small number of residents, the cost per resident is very high. In that case, it got to $180,000 a year per resident. 
Now, why wouldn't the state just close it? Well, the reason they could never get it together to close it is because to close an institution correctly, not the way they did it in the lower 48, because we don't care how they do it in the lower 48, you have to provide the community alternatives first before you move people into the community. Well, that would require the state to continue to pay to run Harborview while making another investment in the community, essentially paying twice. Well, no legislature legislator wants to pay twice for two or three years and then lose an election because they're spending too much money so the next guy can get credit for closing Harborview. And so there we sat for years, balanced, with this institution on the edge of extinction. When the trustees came in, they went to the legislature and the governor and they said, well, look, we know we can do this. Here's the deal. We will use trust income to hold you harmless financially for this transition. Now, this was interesting. It was the first trust project that we've done of this magnitude, committing millions of dollars to this effort. And the advocates were so excited because they thought, oh, we have this mental health trust and it's going to be investing in group homes and foster homes and family supports and, and the trust money is going to go to great use. Imagine their surprise when they found out the trust was volunteering to fund the operations of the institution. Excuse me? Here we have this trust and you're going to pay for the institution? Well, why would we do that? Because we knew if we funded the community programs, then as soon as Harborview closed, the state would take the savings and leave us funding the services. And could we ever withdraw that funding and throw those people onto the street? Of course not. So the deal was we would run Harborview they would take the money they were spending at Harborview and they would invest that in the community to build community services. And if they reneged along the way, remember the trustees control the trust income. We would stop paying for Harborview. They would have one foot in the institution and one foot in the community and it worked. And I'll give you one more brief example. The other thing we discovered is that women in corrections with chronic mental illnesses were in horrible conditions. 23-hour segregation cells because they were so mentally ill they couldn't participate in the normal population. Some of them were water intoxicators. Are you familiar with that? If you drink enough water, you flush the electrolytes out of your system. You not only get high, you can actually kill yourself. Well, the treatment of choice for this condition in the Department of Corrections was turn the water off in their cells. This is not a way to treat people in any system. At the time, Eldon Mulder was the co-chair of the House Finance Committee, and he was in charge of the Department of Corrections budget. And we had Eldon go out and look at where these women were and their conditions. And then Nelson Page, former chair of the Trust Authority, and myself, met with Representative Mulder. Now, we've been working this problem for about a year and a half. And we said, Eldon, what did you think of these women and where they are and what's happening? He said, oh, this is horrible. I had no idea that these women were living in such terrible conditions. And we said, well... What are we going to do? And he says, well, but you know, it's the Knowles administration. They're Democrats. You can't just give them money because you have no idea what they're going to do with it. In fact, we don't even know how big this problem is. So Nelson reached in his briefcase and he handed him a report that we had had commissioned with trust money that did a snapshot study of every woman with chronic mental illness and corrections on a given day and what they needed. And Eldon looked through it and he says, well, yeah, this is the kind of information we need but he says, you don't understand, this is, this is the Department of Corrections. You know, I can't just give them this money. Uh, I mean, there's no telling what they'll do. We don't even have a plan. And Nelson reached in his briefcase. And he says, well, the next thing we did is we funded a planner to work with the department to come up with a way to serve these women. 
And Eldon looked through the plan and he says, well, this makes sense. We've got clinical people. We've got a unit for them. This all looks pretty good. He got to the end and he literally hit himself in the forehead and said, $600,000 a year? $600,000 a year? You don't understand. I have a cap for the Department of Corrections for my budget. I'm the co-chair of the Finance Committee. If I break my cap, then everybody breaks their cap and the world as we know it comes to an end. You know, I'd like to do something here, but $600,000 is just, there's no way I can do this. And Nelson looked at him and said, well, Representative Mulder, we understand you're in the process of trying to cut money from the budget, and so here's the deal. We will fund the entire $600,000 the first year. We will fund two-thirds of that the following year, and one-third of it the year after that. I call this the no money down, three easy payments, order before midnight tonight. <laughs> and so Eldon got a napkin, literally a napkin, and he wrote on there and he says, well, wait a minute. So over three years, which is a long time for a legislator, over three years, this is $1.8 million and you're going to spend $1.2? And Nelson looked at him with a straight face and said, Representative Mulder, this is why you settled the Mental Health Lands Trust case. This is why you have the trust authority. This is why we are here to help you. And Representative Mulder said, oh, this is great, sold. We walked out in the hallway and Nelson looked at me and said, and over 10 years, that $6 million worth of services and we spent 1.2. <laughs> and so repeatedly, the trust strategy has been to take our long-term perspective and leverage that against the legislature's short-term perspective. And it works every time even when they see it coming. So, how do we work with the commission? Well, one of the things that we've done is at the beginning, we sort of had a shotgun approach to projects. The commission and other boards would bring us ideas uh, all across the service delivery system and we would fund various pilot projects and there wasn't really a lot of coherency to it. And so several years ago, in partnership with our boards, including you, we tried to focus down on those areas that we felt were most critical to uh, devoting substantial resources to, to try to actually get movement over time. And so the five that we've ended up with are housing, trust beneficiary initiatives for peer support, a criminal justice initiative. Remember, the Department of Corrections is still our number one provider of mental health services. Uh, and uh, bring the kids home. Along with those, the overarching focus area is workforce development. When you're looking at bringing the kids home, uh, community services of any kind, if we don't have a qualified workforce, it's academic whether we're able to get funding for these programs. So these five focus areas that were set in conjunction and collaboration with the boards are where we put the majority of funding uh, from the trust. And we encourage and support the participation of the boards in being part of those work groups. Each focus area has its own work group. And in fact, probably one of the most important roles of the trust is as a convener. Bringing folks together, getting them in the room around a particular issue, and having the people that know what they're doing decide what needs to be done. Now, that's not always easy in state government. State government has a tendency to believe that they can figure it out and they'll let you know when they're ready what your role is in carrying out their plan. But we don't operate that way. So we are very dependent upon your participation in each of those work group areas. Because again, just as you as a board draw upon the expertise of the people that you bring to your table, we rely on the expertise that you bring to our work group tables uh, to work on that. The other way that we work closely together is on advocacy issues. You know, what we used to do is every group would go on their own down to Juneau with their own legislative agenda and then wonder why with that kind of a fragmented effort very few things ever got done. And so now what we're doing is identifying those advocacy priorities that we all share.
that we can work on together. And of course, last year, our most notable early major success was an expansion to the state Medicaid program uh, to include a fuller range of adult dental services under the Medicaid program. And I will tell you this, you could not have gotten a bet from anybody that we could have gotten that bill passed before last session. With the pressure that the Medicaid program is under financially, the idea of expanding coverage was truly thought to be a fool's errand. How did we get it done? We got it done by all of us working together. And this year, one of our priorities is the housing trust. And we are very confident that if we continue to work together, uh, we'll be able to get that passed as well. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of the history of the trust, why you are so integral to our efforts, why you are one of our principal partners, and why we look forward to working with you for many years to come. Thanks. Do you have any questions?